I'm happy to announce our first ever members only fishing tournament, the Halloween Bash on Tourney X. The tournament is going to go from October 12th until midnight on Halloween. Registration is open now and it ends Monday, October 14th at midnight. You must be a Patreon supporter to enter this competition. For the $20 entry fee for the tournament, I am guaranteeing $100 for the biggest largemouth caught, $100 for the biggest smallmouth caught, $100 for the biggest rock bass, $100 for the biggest sunfish, and I'll be paying out a first place and a second place, and those numbers will be dependent on how many people sign up. Again, the tournament is $20 for Patreon members only, and to be a Patreon member and to help support Fishing the DMV, it's only $6 a month. And for that $6, which is less than a pack of Senkos or Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 15% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, loads of members-only content, our monthly photo contest giveaway, and of course, for this month, our Halloween Bash Fishing Tournament. Again, if you would like to join this community and join this really cool fishing tournament, Link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we're heading back to the Potomac River with the BFL winner. So it's a super tournament kind of thing where they chopped it up to two different events. The one that was on the, the 14th of September. I'm here with Alex Johnson. Dude, this is your first major BFL win. Congratulations. It Thanks. was an absolutely hard fought victory. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, is, uh, it definitely is the first BFL I've ever won. It's actually the second BFL I've ever fished. So, holy crap! <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't fish the whole season. My buddy Jason fished the whole season. And I just really liked the Potomac, and he just wanted somebody to go with. So, me and my buddy Brennan, when we found out there were going to be two tournaments, we were like, "Screw it, we'll go down and make a trip out of it." So it was kind of like, I mean, I decided to fish it like a week or two before we went. So it was kind of like a last minute deal, and it. I guess I'm pretty glad I went. Yeah, and I know we're getting ahead of ourselves here, so I, I definitely want to, to give you your, your your moment here with just your history and everything, because it's cool that a little background for you guys don't know, uh, Alex has called into the show a couple of times when I do the call-in shows, and you've talked about growing up in Jersey, and I just want to explain that to the audience, like how you got into all this. Yeah, I mean, growing up in Jersey, fishing wasn't easy. I definitely wasn't into bass fishing like I am now my whole life. I mean, I fished here and there growing up, but my dad was a trout fisherman because that's like the only thing they actually stock in the state of New Jersey. So I grew up doing that with him and then going to ponds and stuff. But I didn't really get into bass fishing until I was 16 years old when a buddy of mine who you might actually have heard of, uh, Louis Minetti, mm -hmm. the kid who won the college classic bracket and stuff, he... Uh, messaged me on Instagram and convinced me to join a fishing club. And I didn't really know what a fishing club meant. And it turned out to be like a bass tournament club. And I just like showed up with two little five foot ugly sticks, had no idea what I was doing. And from the first event, I was like, yep, I'm doing this forever now. So <laughs> what is that like in, in Jersey for people that don't understand? Cause I'm just fascinated where like we get these pockets of anglers and okay. Out West it's tough, but there are some big lakes mm -hmm. south, of course, but Jersey, where do you fish? What are typical bodies of water that you guys crack your teeth on? So in, in Jersey, you got a couple things. You got the Delaware river, which is a landmine filled river with a six foot tide swing. That is not easy to get into when you first start fishing. There's Lake Apakong, which is just a normal lake, but it's the only lake you can run an outboard on. So there's 87,000 pleasure boaters and it's a washing machine and the fishing sucks. Wow. And other than that, for the most part, you pretty much have a bunch of trolling motor only lakes, some that are way too big to be trolling motor only and a lot that are appropriate in size for that. Uh, you know, a lot of tiny lakes, like I got a place, Farrington down the street 
from the house. It's like a 200 acre, almost river system type lake, which is what I grew up fishing. It doesn't get deeper than like six feet. Um, hmm. So there's a lot of that going on in New Jersey. And then there's a lot of like watershed reservoirs. Like I just came five minutes ago from Manasquan Reservoir, which is a pretty big reservoir. I mean, not not big by South standards, but big for New Jersey. But all those reservoirs, for the most part, are owned by the state or hmm. water companies. And they only let you run your trolling motor. Like uh, 10 acres, 98, 100. Like what's the vibe on the size of these? Just spit uh, Manasquan, I think, is like... 900 that's not bad okay um, no some some of the like like the big reservoirs are, are are not bad i think a couple of them reach a thousand i think like spruce run and round valley and stuff dang but uh a majority of the lakes we're fishing out here you know are two to four hundred acre lakes aside from the reservoirs and hapakong which is like 2,900 or something like that. And that's the only lake really that you're allowed to run full bore besides uh, the river. When you're dealing with reservoirs that size and, and, and the pressure in the fish, the body's water near you are, is legendary. Yeah. How do you take information when you listen to uh, like an Ike live tactical bass saying bass master magazine, all these things where it's like, okay, we're on Kentucky Lake or, or clear, like are these massive places, but it's like, does everything translate to like just beat for beat to what you're doing or did you have to make adjustments on some of the information that you filter through no i think i think very rarely does the hmm. usual bass fishing stuff like take effect in most of these lakes i mean you know we're talking about manasquan is pretty good but aside from manasquan we're talking about lakes where you're scraping together to get five, like, like you're probably catching five on five different baits and you're just hitting everything that like looks good to maybe get a bite. Like I, I fished college and stuff. So I've fished, you know, all over the place and like a bunch of big lakes and stuff and fishing local stuff in Jersey and fishing like bigger tournaments on like actual bodies of water. It teaches you how to junk fish. It teaches you how to break down a specific mm. area and it teaches you how to learn a lot of different baits but in terms of like the big scale of like patterns where fish go seasonally stuff like that it it really like doesn't seem at least for me to translate much at all you mentioned i want to make sure we bring this up too but you fished in college before i get to my next thought here yeah, where'd yeah. you fish yeah so i fished for uh ramapo college okay up in north jersey it's in mob it's like right on the border of New York and New Jersey, which unfortunately because of COVID and all sorts of other stuff, that team doesn't exist anymore, mm. but, uh, we were pretty good for my four years and the 10 or so years before me, I believe we were the, at, at the time of my graduation, we were the only school, um, to have made every single college national championship on the FLW side since it like was invented. I remember seeing Ramapo when we went to Murray and Kiwi for the two FLW championships we were a part of. Um, they yep. were solid, always solid. Yeah. You probably saw Joe and Andy Zaff, the brothers. They were really good back in the day. I actually used to live with Andy for a little while. So that's so freaking cool. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Something for me growing up in Northern Virginia where, yeah, you have the title Potomac, but besides that Northern Virginia, there's not a lot of like, like lake lakes. And mm -hmm. when I went to Lake Murray for the first time, that was my first time experiencing anything like south of Kerr. And I was like, oh shit, this is different. This is massive. It's really big. Yeah. When you take that mindset of, I can pick a creek apart really easily because I'm used to this small area, but then you go to a Kentucky, these hundred thousand acre reservoirs. What challenges are there with that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this quick story, actually. It's probably funny because you guys talk about Smith Mountain Lake uh, somewhat on this podcast, and that was my first college tournament ever was Smith Mountain Lake. Hmm. I was 18 years old. I towed down there with a bass boat. I had just bought three or four weeks earlier. I'd never turned the key on it. I didn't know how to drive a boat. I was in the middle of the lake out by the dam going back and forth and back and forth for two hours because I was scared to get on plane. Like every time the boat rose up, I didn't know that that's what the boat was supposed to do. That's crazy. 
So, I mean, we, me personally, I really went out there knowing nothing because the only tournaments I had fished before were, you know, the youth tournaments in the Bass Nation around here. And they were all on trolling motor only lakes. So I had only ridden, even ridden in a bass boat, like going fast, like once ever. So <laughs> I really had no idea what I was doing. It takes time. It takes time to get the comfort. That's the thing too, is like just the comfort, not feeling awkward doing what you're doing and second guessing yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was definitely, um, it was quite the experience. I mean, it, the first tournament actually didn't go as, as bad as you would think it would go, but, but most of my practice was not thinking about how do I break down this lake? How do I fish this, that, and the other? It was just thinking about like, how does all this stuff work? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> when did it start clicking this bigger bodies of water? Um, so I, I would say I, I got lucky a couple times early in, in my career. I had a top 10 my freshman year and I had a top 10 my sophomore year. So I got into the national championship both of those times, but to be totally honest, both of those, I think, were kind of just like I ran into them by accident. Uh, my junior year, I think, is when it really started clicking for me. And and the biggest thing was, for me at least, was getting confidence and like just more time on the water. I knew what I was doing. I started to understand things the right way, patterns, baits. I, you know, I knew how to do everything. Like even mm -hmm. coming to college, I didn't know how to throw every type of bait. I didn't have all the right equipment. You know, um, so once I kind of kind of felt like I knew what I was doing and I got that confidence to not be scared when I showed up at a tournament, but to be That's like, big. That's big. Yeah. yeah. I used to show up my freshman year and be like, oh, that guy's there. He's good. That guy's mm -hmm. there. He beat me. This guy, that guy. And then junior year, a switch just flipped where I was like, no, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to beat that guy. I'm going to beat that guy. I'm going to beat that guy. And yeah, about halfway through my junior year, I think it clicked. And me and my partner, Zach, went on a run from that day that it clicked to when I graduated. I think we top 10, six or seven tournaments in a row. Um, wow. And, you know, after that, I had all the confidence in the world. So... <laughs> Uh, I've been knocked down and back up a few times since, but, but that was really the major key was not being afraid of it anymore. That's so key too. Cause in any sport, you know, whether it's baseball, fishing, basketball, it's this intimidation factor and getting over that. And we don't talk about that a lot really about, well, and sometimes it's not just the body of water. It could be who you're going up against. I remember the first college tournament I went to, you know, we picked our jerseys off of the Walmart shelf, like the night before and Sharpie to SU on it because, and then you show up in, in Penn state at the time, like they had like, a sh they had so much funding. It was insane. They all had matching jerseys, boats wrapped. And I was like, why are we here? We can't, we can't do this. And it took a long time. It took that first year until we felt like, okay, yeah, we know how to catch them on title and stuff. It's we, we can compete some places and we get in our heads so much as anglers. It's crazy, but it works both ways. Cause I know that there are people that will see bigger bodies of water and be like shocked. Like, oh, we can't do this. But on the flip side, there are people that can't fish in crowds that if you put them on a tiny body, of, they think if it's, if it's not a hundred thousand acres, it's too small. They can't fish. There's too many people. And it's so crazy, man, to see both sides of that coin. Some people saying like it's too tiny and others people saying it's too big. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, the biggest thing for sure has always, and, and still is to this day is the mental aspect of it. When I'm in the right headspace and feeling good, I feel like I'm going to perform. And when I'm not, that's when, you know, when I spin out, when I panic, when I freak out, th those are the days that, that things go wrong. You know, I spend a lot of time on the water. I fish a ton. That, the, the skills and the learning about the fish and all that, like, that is a direct response to how much time you're out there doing it. Um, but the mental part of it, you know, that's all on you. And, and that, that seems to mainly be, that was a turning point for me. And it's the thing that clicked. And then also like off of what you were saying, fishing in crowds, you know, I fished, I fished and still do fish a ton at the Chesapeake Bay. 
So mm-hmm. out on that flat, I, I, <laughs> whether it's for good reason or bad reason, I've gotten very used to having to fish around people and it really doesn't bother me much at all. That place is crazy. It's such a weird, it's such a weird layout where you have the bowl itself. I, I fished, you know, two college regional events there. I fished some ABA stuff and you have the bowl, but then you have all these creeks all over God's earth you can run to. Mm-hmm. And it is, if there, if the bite is in the bowl or the Northeast river, it is a traffic jam. It's insane what you have to deal with. It reminds me of like Mattawoman Creek in Potomac in the springtime where there's just so many boats back in there. Do, when you fish in those crowds, like what do you do mentally to kind of keep yourself in the game? Well, I, I think the best thing in, in somewhere specifically like the Chesapeake is the better I've gotten out on the bay, because I'm sure like everybody else, everybody struggles bad when you first start getting out there. But now that I kind of know what's going on, I've kind of settled into the mindset of I'm going to be on that flat for eight straight hours and I'm, they're going to bite eventually and yeah. I'm gonna catch them. So even if it's hour five and I don't have a bite, you know, you see a lot of people come into an area, fish for a little leave, come into an area, fish for a little leave. And when you're in that crowd for eight hours and there's 30 people there when you start, but there's 30 people there when you finish and it's 30 completely different people. Mm -hmm. If I was there for all eight hours and I know the fish are there, I just feel like I'm, I'm going to have a better chance because at some point in that day, those fish are going to turn on for 20 minutes and if you're not there for those 20 minutes, you're screwed. So if I know the fish are there, I'm going to be there all day and I'm just going to, I'm going to wait everybody out and I, I will not miss that bite window because the bite window's coming. It's always coming and I'm just trying it's to not some- miss it. It's something that I, I noticed in college fishing tidal water, but then it's really been beaten into me the last couple of years. I started to really get more into kayak fishing as well, where we always have misunderstood how many fish are in an area. And once you have live scope, it's like, there's so many more fish in an area, but your brain tells you when you have a 250 on the back, like you got to use it. And it, you're, you hit it on the head really eloquently where if you just stay in the area, you get to learn that area so much more intimately than a guy that just shows up and then he, he leaves and, and fish change within a day, I think. But when you just stay in that cove or whatever that day, you see those micro adjustments, those fish make. And then all of a sudden, you know, like just for that day, for some reason, they're on the first post of this, of two docks. You wouldn't know that unless you were there all day. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's two ways to do it on the bay. It's to have all your spots, know what the right time on the right tide for that spot is and run and follow the tide, hit a hundred spots in a day or sit still on the grass. Now in order to do the first one, you got to fish down there a hundred days a year. Mm -hmm. I don't get to do that. A lot of guys don't get to do that. Once I kind of settled into the biggest fisher on the flat, this is how you catch them. This is what I got to do. That's when I started having the most success down there because as a guy who doesn't live there, you know, it's about a two hour drive for me to get there. Um, it's really the only shot I feel like I have to win a tournament there. You've mentioned before where like you really like the Potomac river, but yet if I could be mistaken. The Potomac's a little bit farther than the upper bay. Absolutely. What, what about the upper, what about the Potomac river? Do you like more than let's say the upper bay? The Potomac River, me and my my best friend and my tournament partner, Ryan, we have just, I don't know what it is, we have just like a, a draw to the Potomac River. We always have. Our, our sophomore national championship was on the Potomac River. And that was the first time I'd ever been there. And it was, we had a really good first day. And then the second day it blew like 35 and we weren't able to get to our spot and we dropped from like 10th to like 60th or something like that or whatever. But ever since that week, I've just had an obsession with the place. It just, it just clicks with me. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know why. I just love, the, I've always been a huge grass fisherman. Grass fishing is, is, is my favorite way to fish. And you know, it's, it's like the bay in, in, terms of like it's tidal, there's grass fishing, but there's just so many more options at the Potomac. Mm -hmm. You get so many more bites. 
And there's so many more things that you can do. And it's just, it's just fun. Like even going to the Potomac to just fun fish me and my buddy Ryan try to get down there at least once a year to, to just go and fish wh- whether it's a tournament or not, just because I don't know what it is. It just clicks with me. It's just one of my, it's ever since that first time we fished, it's been one of my favorite places in the entire country to fish. Do you like running the tide then on the Potomac? You talked about on the upper Bay where you like to kind of pick an area out and work it. Yeah, I'll definitely move more on the Potomac than on the Bay, especially this time of year, like in September, as opposed to the spring. Like in the spring, I feel like, I mean, I mean, it's tough. Hardcover always does seem to provide like slightly bigger fish, but slightly less bites. But I feel like in the spring, you can find an area or find a grass bed and sit there all day and, and camp, and, yeah, and, and catch them. But this time of year, uh, I mean, I'm, I know guys do it. I know guys have done it, but I, I haven't found it, but you know, I'm not from the area. This is my first time down there all year. I had two days of practice, found a few things and I, I run them. And from what I saw, I didn't think I had any type of like grass bed that I could sit in all day and compete. Well, I mean, that kind of gets us into it where, how did the conversation go down where you said you didn't try to fish all the BFLs this year? So did he have to like twist your arm to get you to even show up to this one? Well, like I said, I, I like to try to get to the Potomac every year just to do it just cause I like it. And we never got the chance to go this spring and, you know, September obviously isn't the best fishing, but, um, I work, I, I do uh, commercial pools, so whatever point is my season's kind of ending mm-hmm. I have a little bit of time here where I got like nothing going on. Like I finished closing my pools on Wednesday before we went down to the tournament. So I kind of just had some free time and I knew he was going down and he was like, Oh, you should come fish. And it, it really didn't take much convincing at all. Cause I, I wasn't doing anything else anyway. And I really wanted to get down to the river. So I said, screw it. And I jumped in the truck and went down. Did you try to rely on with the couple of days of practice fish new water or just check on things that you found in the past and fish history? I did a I did a little bit of both. I started off trying to fish new water because I I I had felt like the last couple of times I'd been to the Potomac I was relying a little too much on history. It's some of it was starting to fade a bit. So I started off trying to fish new water and it just like kind of wasn't great. Mm-hmm. And then I started to go back to some of my old stuff and, and get bites. And I was like, oh, okay. And then all of a sudden running stuff I knew practice started going really, really well. And I wound up fishing in the tournament, like I, I would say a 50-50 mix of old and new. But fishing the old stuff let me know like what type of mood they were in and like what they were doing so that I could expand on that. When you say stuff, do you mean like a, a grass flat or more of like hard cover? And then you expand it from there on the grass flat or in the hard cover pattern? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to do both. Like the, okay. the strategy I was taking in practice was hit a grass spot, hit a hard cover spot, hit a grass spot, hit a hard cover spot, just to kind of get an idea of, you know, which they were on better. And and the funny part about it is it wound up kind of being both like I was fishing hard cover in the tournament, but it had to be hard cover like in a grass bed with grass around it. Like it couldn't just be a barren bank of laydowns. Well, I guess it could have been. I caught some fish doing that in mm-hmm. practice. The stuff I fished in the tournament was a mix of wood, sticks, some little rock piles I had found, and a couple of docks that were just surrounded by milfoil and hydrilla mix. So, so the grass like had to be present, but I wasn't necessarily just like aimlessly fishing the grass. I did catch a couple, you know, aimlessly fishing the grass going in between stuff. But really what I was trying to do is hit, you know, hop from hard target to hard target to hard mm. target. Was that something that you felt confident based on practice? Or was that something that developed during the tournament where it's like, oh, I just, I cracked it. Yeah, so th- the main area I wound up fishing during the tournament 
which I, I don't care. I'll just, I was down in a quai for shocker. I didn't catch every fish there, but that's where the bulk of my mm-hmm. weight came from. Um, and I pulled into there. It, it, it's always been like, it, it's definitely my favorite Creek on the Potomac, but it bites you sometimes. I've had a lot of times mm. where I have a really good practice in a quai, and then I roll up there the next day and they're just not doing it anymore. Especially the run. Like it is a deceptively long run down there. Um, especially if you want to go to like uh Potomac Creek, Nanjuan or Port Tobacco, like the, yes. it, it, for people that don't know it, it, depending on your boat, the wind and the tide, it can beat the snot out of you going that far down there. I, I guess it's from like, the East river to gunpowder, I guess would be kind of like a thing for people that are up there kind of ish, yeah. but again, you commit to it. Um, unless you're driving hundred miles an hour, I don't know how you're going to get back up and fish near, near DC too. Like, I guess you could, yeah. but yeah. Well, I actually, on the second day of the tournament, which was a huge mistake, <laughs> I ran all the way from a to Piscataway in the middle of the day <sighs> Dang. and then back to Matta woman, which I very much shouldn't have done, but Was I did an hour of driving. Uh, no, not quite. Um, probably 40 minutes. Oof. Oof. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot. Like, yeah, Piscataway's just been offish. I don't know why it's not what it used to be four or five years ago when people are pulling 30 pound bags out of there. Yeah. I, I actually, on Thursday in practice, I found a stretch of, of like, just like lay downs and pieces of wood, just kind of like out in the middle. Mm-hmm. And I caught a four pounder off of one. I caught a three pounder off the other. And then I put a bobber stop on my hook and flipped like 10 more. I got bit on every single one. So then the second day of the tournament, I decided to run all the way up there and didn't get bit on a single one of them. So <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting thing you bring up, though. It's like in a multi day event, hard cover versus grass. It, I wonder how much that same situation plays out where no matter where that hard cover was going day two, there's a great chance you got picked clean versus if you had grass fish day two, there's probably a couple left. Yeah. It, well, the interesting thing about day two was, I uh, I was, I still weighed a limit. I had like 10 pounds. I finished in like 30th on day two, but I got probably just as many bites that day. They were just, a lot smaller and I actually did have the bites to compete again on day two. I Hmm. just, uh, I have one that's going to haunt me for, for a really long time. Uh I, I tied a bad knot on my jig and I, I knew it. I knew that I tied a bad knot because I looked at it and it looked funky. And instead of just cutting it off and retying it, I just like pulled on it and I was like, like as hard as I could and it didn't break. And I was like, Oh, okay, fine. Mm. the that flip that first flip i stick five and a half six pounder oh my god and jesus i got it right next to the boat walloping back and forth at the uh surface and the knot holes Mm. dude it's it's crazy how much of your life you could see in slow motion when stuff like that happens i'll I'll see that fish in my life (laughs) every day it it, it was like i had a five eight which was oh. the one for the tournament the day before. And this fish looked bigger. Mm. Was it a new stretch you were fishing or just like, okay, this was some stuff I was saving for day two. Or are you just like experimenting because you won already and the pressure's off? Funny enough, uh, the whole morning I was fishing through the same stuff I'd fished the day before. And I caught like 15 fish, but they were – they just weren't big. They were all like one and a half, two pounders. I got one bite before this, which was my second big bite that I screwed up where I was just flipping grass kind of aimlessly with a jig. And I thought I was caught on a stalk of grass and I went pop, pop like this to pop it out of the grass and a four pounder jumps with my jig in his mouth. Um, Mm. So I lose that fish and now I'm already kind of freaking out and I'm like, screw it. Let me fish new stuff. And I ran to like the back of a quai and pulled up on a dock. And that was where I, a, a dock I've never fished. And that's where I lost the big one. Mm. 
Yeah, Kwai is is legendary because there's um there's Wednesday and Thursday nighters out of the back of a Kwai that help restock it. It's like one of those places that constantly gets re- refueled, and it's uh like the and if you guys that don't know, like the beach is out there. That's a huge spawning bay right out in the front of, of a Kwai. Um, was were you surrounded by boats, or did you feel like you had that that area within the area to yourself? So here's the funny thing: on the first day of the tournament, I, I was like one of the last boat numbers. And I was really mad about it because the day before on Friday, I had fished down there and I'd cut my hooks off so that I didn't stick anything, but I had probably 45, 50 bites. Wow. And there was a lot of boats down there on Friday. And I was like, well, there's no way I'm the only one who found this stuff. Like, cause there were guys all over the place and I was getting so many bites. It was ridiculous. Like, Every piece of hardcover I saw, I would just flip the jig at it right away. Like over and over and over and over again. And then I just left and went home. But so I got a late boat number and I was really mad because I was like, I'm not going to get on the hot stuff. And I go down there on tournament day and there's nobody to be found. Wow. The, The whole day I saw three, maybe four tournament boats. Mm. Sunday was a different story. I think probably a lot of guys who didn't catch them or maybe had heard that that's where the bite was tried to go do it on Sunday. There was a lot of guys down there on Sunday. But on Saturday, I was I was pretty much by myself. I saw guys, but nobody was fishing the same stuff that I was fishing. So, yeah, you, so you blast out a mad woman on Saturday and you turn left and you start heading down. Did it feel like you were looking around like there's not a lot of boats heading this way? Did you get that weird vibe? Yeah, there was one guy right in front of me that I was following, kind of. So I kept like looking behind me to see if anybody was running behind me. And I was like, oh, maybe like guys from the beginning of the tournament. And they're just like so far ahead of me that I can't see them. But the whole run down, I only saw one guy. And uh, I was thinking that the whole time. I was like, what is going on? (laughs) Like, I've had that happen before in tournaments before. It's success on both sides of the spectrum where it's like, I got here and I didn't think I'd have this to myself. Oh crap. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. And there's this weird stress. I think I don't know how to describe this for people that are listening where it's like, you feel like you've gotten this golden cheat code opportunity and you get nervous that you're not going to screw this up, especially when you're dealing with like the Potomac, uh, the upper Bay where a lot of places are traffic jams and you Mm -hmm. get a little bit of time to go to the juice. Like what was running through your mind when you finally got settled in to that? When I got down there and I looked around and I didn't see anybody, honestly, the first thing I thought was, did I make a mistake? Like, (laughs) because (laughs) on the Potomac and the Bay and stuff, like, usually if there's nobody around you, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like, guys figure out where the fish are. Guys know what's going on, especially if you're fishing grass, which, like, I kind of was fishing grass, but not in the traditional sense, but especially if you're fishing grass, like you're probably going to have company. And if you're the only one there, it's either really, really good or really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And then I caught a four and a quarter on my second cast. And I immediately was not worried about that anymore. (laughs) Did you feel like you were going to have to play defense all day? Was it just to stay in that area then? Like what was your strategy as the day progressed? I had, I had about four different like little stretches and I definitely didn't, I, I wasn't, I thought I was going to have to play defense or kind of just like pick my battles. Like I didn't think I would have free range of those stretches all day. Like I did. Um, I was expecting like, I'm a late boat number. I'm going to get down there and I'm just going to squeeze into like whatever is open out of all this stuff. But I got down there and it was all open. Mm. So I wound up just kind of being able to do whatever I wanted. But I was super, super concerned the night before that I was going to have a ton of company. But I I really got to just do whatever I wanted all day. I mean, that's such a that's a big deal, guys. Like when you're fishing these type of waters is that defensive strategy. And I and maybe this happens more on like TVA places. I'm assuming it does where if it's a good stretch, you just camp no matter what just to hold off other competitors. Oh, or do you just burn an area the best you can and then move on with that? 
as the day progressed, was there a moment in time that your brain started to be like, this is a thing that's happening? Like, yeah. So like I said, my, my second cast was a four and a quarter. And then five minutes later, I catch like a, a decent one, a keeper. And then my third fish of the day was the big fish, the five, eight. Hmm. And I put that fish in the boat and I only had three fish. So I definitely shouldn't have said anything, but I looked at my co-angler and I was like, we're probably going to win this tournament. Dude, you said the thing out loud, man. Yeah, woof. I never do that. I'm, ter- I'm very superstitious and I'm super scared of that. But like, I knew I was going to get bites, but like I said, I didn't set the hook on anything. So I had no idea really what the size was. So I, I wasn't concerned about getting bites. I was concerned about size. So when right away, like the hardest part of the day, you know, catching two kickers, like that's the hardest thing to do. And 20 minutes into the day, it was over. I was like, okay, like we, we have a real shot at this. If we just keep catching fish all day. I had um I had another guy on his name was Wade he fished uh, a kayak event with me and he caught almost like the the trophy the big fish of the tournament and the one thing I talk we talked about is he caught that like early like his second fish and you have the rest of the day and there's this weird conflict in your mind of like I don't want to waste this kicker and it's such a weird thing of like versus you have a limit and you need a kicker versus if you catch your kicker first and then the whole day you're like, crap, I cannot believe you start having all those terrible thoughts to yourself. Like, am I going to waste this five, six, seven pounder? Did that monkey start getting on your back at all that day about that? Like, oh my God, I just need to just a couple more and we got this. So it, it, it did right after I caught that fish, but, but kind of, like I said, I had a couple different stretches and one of them, the, the one I started on was kind of like, one of the sneakier ones because I was expecting there to be company. And I was like, I feel like this is the one that nobody's going to be at. But after I boated that fish, I had another stretch where I probably got the most bites the day before, but it was a little more obvious. And there were also guys around me the day before while it was happening. So I was like, Oh, there's definitely going to be somebody there. But when I kind of got to looking around and realizing that nobody was really down there, I was like, let me just run that stretch because I know there's a ton of bites there. So only like probably five, 10 minutes after I caught the five, eight, I picked up and I ran to that stretch. And then I had my limit in like five casts. So, so awesome. Mm. So I felt, I felt pretty good, pretty, I mean, you know, from fishing tournaments, like whether they're 12 inches or whether they're good ones, like getting five in the boat early, just like calms you down so much. And I had five for about 16 something like probably would have been enough to win the tournament anyway in like an hour. It's weird about that when you fish a body of water a lot um, compared to like when we went out to Ohio, I think we fished Indian Lake. That's when FLW for some reason put that on the calendar for us. And we're like, rumors of that. Oh, dude, dude, (laughs) that place was a nightmare. We, we, (laughs) <laughs> lost we came in second by a couple of ounces with like nine pounds and it was like 10 pounds to win it was <laughs> nuts how much of a nightmare it was but we thought like oh we did shit and we were telling we got like nine pounds like guys you might have won this. what the hell are you talking about it's like but when you fish a place so intimately and you're you get that feeling like i got about 16 that puts me like right here and yeah i mean dude like again like i mean let's beat around the bush 18 pounds like did you weigh all your fish throughout the day to kind of keep a mental track on it or do you just kind of like how do you do that yeah, it really it really depends on like how nervous and rattled I am, whether or not I'm gonna weigh all my fish. On on that day, I did weigh my fish. I, I was saying to my buddies, I had like a unusual like calm about me. Like even when I caught the big one, like I wasn't even shaking. Usually, like I get a three pounder in the boat and I'm rattling. Mm-hmm. Like I put that five eight in the live well and like was cool as a cucumber, which is very unusual for me. So I was taking my time. I was weighing every fish. I was keeping track of it. I had a, like I said, in that first hour, I had about 16 and a half, which Mm. at the end of the day, looking at the results, it would have, I think, been enough to do it. But 
in my head, I definitely didn't think so. Even, even coming into the weigh-in with what I had, I had felt like I was one fish away. I thought I needed to break into 19 because I, I was just like, you know, I'd gotten quite a few bites. The fishing was pretty, I mean, I had tough stretches in the middle of the day once we kind of lost the tide, but like the fishing in the morning was good enough for me that I was like, other guys caught them. It's probably going to take 19. And I had also broken off a like three and a half pounder on a spinning rod, like later in the day. And I was fully convinced that that was the fish that was going to cost me. So I, I really didn't think I had won the tournament until I was in the weigh-in line and I was one of the last guys to weigh in and I saw what the leaderboard was. That's when it first finally kind of clicked in me like, oh, I'm, I think I'm going to actually win this tournament. But up until that point, I, I, I didn't think I won. It's dude, soak it up because it, it is that first win you get, it, it sticks with you. And it's not just the, it's so weird to explain this to people like, at least for me, when I was fishing college, I thought like, well, it's because it's a team event because it's college. Once I got and I won that ABA Open against all of the Potomac River sticks, and I was like, oh, I don't completely suck at fishing. It's a confidence thing more than it's the money or the trophy. It's I can hang with my peers if I work hard at it. Yeah, and, and, and the cool thing for me is, like I said, I, I fished a lot of college tournaments. I fished the New Jersey Bass Nation, which is what like I mainly fish now. And I had a lot of top tens in college. In in the nation last year, I won Angler of the Year, but I didn't win anything. Dang, dude. Yeah. But my my I I've been like I, I'm good with consistency, but I haven't up until this point had like a signature like big win. Like I won a New Jersey Nation tournament, but it was in December. And most of the field was out of it and didn't show up. There was like 30 <laughs> boats. Um, so I've, I've always been like a consistent top 10, a lot of seconds, a lot of thirds. But I've, I, I, I keep missing that like I'm always one fish away, it feels like. And, and personally, from the people I've talked to, don't change that because it's so hard as a guy that – I, I feel that I feel that so bad where I have friends, uh, Mr. McCluskey, SB and stuff. They'll they'll put up those 15 inch glide baits and they're OK with like I'll blank or I'll win. And I at my soul, when I try to push that, I suck. I just I can't swing for the fence. I'm not good at it. But if I try to bat for average, I'm not I, I feel like mentally I like I'm in my swing. It's good. But I don't I don't know. It's such a weird thing that's hard to explain to people. Some people are just good at swinging for the fence. Yeah, I, I've had I have so many buddies who are like that, who like want to throw the big baits, want to throw the cool baits, want to throw stuff to get bigger fish. And I, I have always and, and me and my friends like clash about it when we're fishing together and like joke about it and argue about it. But like I'm of the mindset where I am always every single day trying to do and throw whatever is going to get me the most bites today. Like, and, and whatever happens with that happens with that, but I am, I'm not good at swinging for the fences. I'm going to get a couple bites. Hopefully they're the right ones. I, I, I just love getting bit and whatever it is I figure out is the best way to get bites. That's, that's what I'm going to be doing. And I'm just going to catch as many fish as possible and whatever happens, happens. What is it like? when you have to compete on the Delaware river, comparing that to the other tidal fisheries of the upper Bay and the Potomac, the Delaware river is very different and very interesting because the Delaware river has a six foot tide. <laughs> so like sometimes on a high tide, you're, you're fishing spots that are two feet out of the water mm -hmm. on a low tide. So, you, you know, talking about running the tide, it's, it's a completely different, system of management because not only are you thinking about like what's the best time to hit this spot you're thinking about like is it physically possible to hit this spot on that tide you know and and there's some ponds and like little backwaters and like holes and creeks and stuff that are kind of like you know little community holes that you can sit in all day and 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 fish in there but it really depends on the time of the year whether that that can play or not like right now like through the summer 
you really got to be, you know, spot hopping, running the tide on the main river, in, in my opinion. When you have current flows like that, and it makes the Potomac look like a little brook, yeah. can, can the current be too fast in one sense? Like it just starts pulling out so quick, like it's you've passed the bite window, so to speak. Oh, yeah, there's there's like a, a part of the Delaware is like not just knowing where to cast, but like there's some spots you just can't cast because your bait's 100 feet behind the boat Jeez. before it hits the bottom. Um, so in one sense, it makes it it makes it easy sometimes in terms of you can see like you can just look and see where the right spot to cast is because you can see the current seam, you can see the eddy, you can see the break where that fish is going to be sitting. But it also makes it a lot harder in other aspects because, like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not too tough to say. The place is just straight up scary. Like, <laughs> I'm really, yeah. Like, I mean, I it, it's it's rushing out of there so fast. You can get stuck. You can. I mean, mm. if you come into a place when the water is six feet high, right, and you come running in there, you know you're fine. You're fishing in there for a while. Now it's three feet lower. You can run the same line back out and all of a sudden there's a log and you rip your engine off. Mm. You know, and I just started fishing it like two or three years ago because I guess three years ago now, um, because all through college, like I said, I barely knew how to run a bass boat when I first got it. And I was terrified of the place and I just would not go. I was super scared to even attempt to go until a few years ago. And now I, I now I feel pretty comfortable on it. I've, put a lot of time in there and I've learned it and I've done good. Like I said, I won the one Bass Nation tournament out there. So I, I feel like I have a better grip of what's going on now, but it's still like you got to be paying attention all day. Is it even worth it for a person that's not local to pre-fish? Because it feels like places like that, it gets into the, you need 20 to 30 years of experience. You need time to fish every place on every tide swing to where if I have one day to practice, screw it. I might as well just sleep because it's not, it feels like it's not going to help much. There's like, there's like, like I said, like three or four, like pond community hole type things on the river. And if you're not from here and you don't fish a lot, I would advise you to just go to one of those and just sit in there all day because trying to run anything else is just crazy if you don't is that, know what you're doing is, is that the biggest one of the bigger advantages in bass fishing is like the delaware those super high tide swing places compared to like the northern swings for smallmouth or the tva stuff things like that yeah well, well it's well, it's interesting about the delaware because me and my friends have had this conversation about whether it's even worth it to like the time in on the Delaware that we do sometimes because like, is it fun? <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. it actually, it actually can be a lot of fun. You pe people look at that elite series tournament. It was in the middle of summer. That's the worst time to be there. You, you don't have big bags there most of the time, but I mean, you can go there. We have 30, 40, 50 fish days on the river all the time. Wow. In terms of getting bites, it's actually a really good fishery. They just, hmm don't typically grow huge. I mean, there, there are, there are big bags in there. Some guy weighed 20 last fall, which wow. was insane. It's the biggest bag anybody has ever seen there. But, um, but you, you get a lot of bites. It's, it's a lot of fun, but we talk about whether it's worth it in terms of like a lot of the stuff you learn on the Delaware is like only for the Delaware. Mm -hmm. And like, aren't really any major tournaments out there like we fish a lot of tournaments there in the fall just like open buddies and nation tournaments and like local stuff but aside from like wanting to cash checks and do well in the local stuff a lot of the delaware learning feels like wasted time because i don't hmm. know what it translates to anything else that's an interesting viewpoint on that that's interesting because i and I'm, I've not, been, I'm not sold on that. We go back and forth about whether it matters or not. It's it's a conversation me and my buddies who fish there have all the time. Well, it, it's something that I've played around with mentally of, can you fish one body of water too much? So example is there's a lot of people that I would consider extremely good on the Potomac. Fantastic. And if you take them off of the Potomac, they don't know what to do. You put a, you put a, a, a ferry wand in their hand in 30 feet of clear water, they don't know what to do. And it's like, is there a bell curve? Like I fish this place enough if I truly want to like 
advance as a bass angler. I need to stop fishing this place and go fish something completely different and get good there. So you're not just a one trick pony. And some people say like, no, cause you need, you need that one place. You always cast a check, but then others like, yeah, you need to not suck other places. So I do think there's that balance. Yeah. I mean, I always, I, I think the, the major advantage I've always had was that I got to do college fishing. I got dropped into True. places all around the country that I knew nothing about. I didn't know how to fish them. And that's really how I learned to bass fish was through college. Like if I took just strictly like the stuff I know from fishing these small lakes in Jersey and then went out to the Potomac or went out to Smith mountain or, you know, went out somewhere and tried to compete just based on that knowledge. I don't, I mean, sometimes it would, but I think most of the time it would not translate well. I think mm -hmm. that I got lucky learning a lot of different bodies of water just from the point of, I know, I know to have an open mind when I show up somewhere. Like I'm not super preconditioned to a certain style of fishing. And the nice thing about it, at least when I was fishing college, the old FLW days, it was you were competing against your peers in these events and it wasn't a bunch of locals poaching it, if that makes any yeah. sense. And it made it feel like, you know, you could compete and it wasn't just trying to poach like the Potomac teams or the Battle of the Borders or something up there where you are, where it's like, yeah, this guy's been fishing it for 30 years. I can't beat him. It kind of evens that playing field out, which... Yeah. I, I really wish they could find that kind of magic formula for outside of college to where like a pro am where it's like it's just for people with six years of experience or whatever and stuff. So you could really see how you fare against people that are about at your same uh, knowledge or skill level. Yeah. And it was also just like straight up fun. Like most yeah. of the, we were traveling with with we had a few different boats on our team. We would travel with other teams. We would travel with the guys from Penn State we would travel with guys from Delaware and stuff. And like, it was just a good time. We were all just going down fishing. And like, obviously you were trying to compete and I was always, you know, trying to do well in tournament, but it wasn't like you weren't thinking about it too hard. And it wasn't mm -hmm. like crazy pressure. Like we were just hanging out with the guys and going fishing. And then on tournament day, you, you did your best, but it didn't, it, it didn't feel like a business trip all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, what was your favorite place that you got to go in college? favorite favorite i mean i i guess the, the, the real answer i guess would be the potomac because it made me always want to go back and i never would have went if it wasn't for that college tournament but honestly again in your region one of my favorite fishers. anywhere doesn't have to be the region anywhere that is like no you got any, to travel there even yeah. out of anywhere one of my favorites was smith mountain lake i love smith mountain lake that's a pretty, it's, it's crazy. I really hope the BBT, again, I know some people are against this, but it'll show off that lake as being, it's a hidden gem. It really yeah. is. Um, there are so many lakes where you do need forward facing sonar to compete. That's one of the few places you could just tie on a mag draft and skip docks and you might hit pay dirt with a 30 pound bag and win. Um, it's yeah. pretty crazy. The, the last time we were there in college, we were there in June and it was during the shad spawn. And I was throwing a top water walking bait against rip wrap and catching like five and six pounders. And it was like some of the most fun fishing I've ever had. Like it, it, it's, it's a, we, we were there a couple times in April, which was like a little pre-spawn. Sometimes there were some on beds and then we were there in June uh, during that shad spawn. And, and both times were very different and a lot of fun, but during that shad spawn was unreal. Oh yeah, dude. Like that place with, with how much bait is in there. It is stupid. It really is. Um, yeah, yeah. That place is absolutely amazing. Um, a Alex, again, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on again, guys, winner of the, uh, September 14th, uh, Potomac river BFL with 18 pounds, 12 ounces. What do you got coming up on the schedule? What, what is next for you? So, um, I guess, I guess the real big, I got a few things on the schedule, but, but the big thing is I have the Bassmaster national championship at Grand Lake in Oklahoma, which I'm pretty excited about. That's, you know, from the Bass Nation, like I said, I got in because I, uh, I won Angler of the Year last year and they switched the format where if you win Angler of the Year in your state, you get to skip the regional. 
Hmm. So you know how they kind of changed the format where like anybody can just buy their way into the regional now? Yeah. So I got, luckily I got to not have to go to that regional and I'm going straight to the national, which is, which is interesting that it's on Grand Lake because one, it sucks how far it is and it's a haul. But the positive thing for me is my senior year, our national championship was on Grand Lake. And I actually almost won that tournament. So I'm excited to attempt to get some revenge on it. It's a very different time of the year. We went in March this year. We're going in November. But uh, it feels like I got a chance for some redemption on that lake. So I'm very, very excited about it. What is it like fishing a place? Because we mentioned Smith, but Smith is like a thimble compared to Grand Lake, Kentucky, like some of these places that are 100,000 acres. Yeah, I've been to both Grand Lake and Kentucky. Uh, Grand Lake, I liked a lot. Kentucky, I did not <laughs> like a lot. That was that was my sophomore year, like I said before. It really clicked, and I was just a lost puppy out there. And uh, we had a pretty good practice in 70 degrees sun flipping bushes. And then the day of the tournament, it was 30 degrees and snowing. And our pattern was flipping bushes in three feet of water. So clearly that didn't go too well. So I never uncovered Kentucky Lake, but Grand Lake was something else, especially considering it was the national championship and you have official practice for that. So we only had two days of practice. Mm. And I ran that whole lake from front to back. I pulled the boat out in the middle of the day, both days of practice to get more gas to go back out and go fishing again. So in two days, I saw pretty much the whole lake. And the reason I ran so much water is the week we were there, you might remember back in 2021 when Texas had that massive power grid failure because of how cold it was. Yeah. Yeah. That was the week we were at Grand Lake. Mm. So the lake was literally freezing over. Like I was driving down the middle of the lake, carving ice. Like it was, yeah, it was freezing over while we were fishing. But because of that, it was brown, dirty, cold, muddy, like horrible. Like everything you pulled up to, you you knew you didn't even have to fish because it was just like I'm not getting a bite here. So I just drove around so I could see everything. And what wound up happening was I found the back of a creek that the water was pretty clear in compared to the rest of the lake. Mm -hmm. It was four degrees warmer than the rest of the lake. And I saw a bait flickering and I was like, okay, I threw out a jerk bait, got a bite left. And that was the only bite I got the entire practice out of the whole house we were at. There were five boats staying with us. And that bite is the only fish that was landing in the entire house. So I said, I'm going to go to that spot and fish there all three days of tournament. And that's exactly what I did. And guys, just to, uh, to let you guys that are really haven't been out West, I just Googled it. Uh, Grand Lake Cherokee is 46,000 acres. So it's damn near double Smith Mount Lake size. So just to give you appreciation of how big an area these places are to, to break down, it's, it's such a big advantage when all these national championships are at Lake Gunnersville or, or, or that way, just for those locals. It's just insane. Yeah. And I was running super far too. I was making like a 45 minute one way run from the ramp to get to my spot. So it, it definitely, you know, between that and we had tournaments on Lake Erie, which is just like, forget That's about the ocean. It. Yeah. You know, so, so I learned the hard way a lot of times how to, how to fish on bigger bodies of water and not be like, super intimidated by it dude i mean again guys wish this guy all the best uh where can people follow you uh on social media if they want to kind of follow your exploits uh yeah i I guess i'm i'm most active on instagram at alex johnson fishing um i got a tiktok and i try to post youtube i'm trying to get better with youtube and stuff i post a lot of like the short videos and just like stuff i do but i used to do full length YouTube videos and then I stopped doing it and I think I'm going to start getting back into it. So maybe check out the YouTube, but mainly find me on Instagram at Alex Johnson fishing. 
Guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything we talked about. Please give Alex a follow and really wish him luck this November as he competes for the for that next championship, the next trophy to put on his uh, old trophy case. And then, guys, if you like to, just uh, give us a follow. Listen to us on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or follow us on Patreon. You know, we're starting our nonprofit next year to work on building up our boat docks around in the area, help improve the facilities, and also possibly do F1 stocking of largemouth in the Potomac River. Like, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.